It's, isn't it good just to come together and just have a great time before you look forward to, you know, the turkey or the goose or the Christmas pudding? Some of you want to pass all of that. You just want to see the presents. Some of you are already planning to fall out with your friends because you taught them what you want. And if they don't give it to you, you're already thinking, it's got to be, I'm not going to give you the same thing. But guess what? The real reason for Christmas is that God so loved the world. Tonight, as uh, we just take a moment to talk about the purpose of this amazing day in history. We want to remind ourselves why Christmas? And not only why Christmas, but what does it mean? The scripture says, I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures and then we'll get into it. I, I thought I'd start from the, one of the most familiar portions, John chapter 3. And uh, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice God loved us so much that he couldn't stay there by himself. He couldn't leave humanity in their condition without God and without hope given to an empty life of just being born and growing up and hopefully going to school, get an education, get a job, get paid, go off on some holidays and vacations and then grow old and die. He so loved us that he did not want us to be consigned to a meaningless existence. So he gave his only son. Christmas is a demonstration of how much God loves you. Of how much loves me, God loves me. If you forget everything about this season, I know it's kind of, you know, snowing outside and a little bit cold. And if you are in a place where you begin to think, oh my God, who really loves me? I want you to remember that the God of heaven, the creator of all the earth, he thought you are that special, that you and I are that important, that he would send his son into the world. But here is the part that I like the most. He, he didn't just love us and send him into the world, but, but he came with a, with a certain attitude. And look at verse 17. Most people don't read this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn him. Notice God's attitude towards you and I. He's never been to find fault with us. The only reason we need a Savior is because we've all messed up. And God is not in your life to, to, to condemn or to emphasize or prove the point that you and I really did mess up. He did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that through him the world might be saved. Notice God sent his son and said, I know there are certain things that you won't be able to do right and there are all kinds of issues and things you're still coming through, but I don't want your own mistakes to make you write yourself off. Because my attitude is I knew how terrible human beings can be, but I still want to be a part of your life. If you forget everything I'm saying today, there is nothing you and I can do to run God away from us. And the only thing that sends people to an eternity without God is not even what they do, because the Bible is very clear. 2 Corinthians tells us God isn't even holding men's sins, men's trespasses against them. It's all clear. The only thing that would cause a person to spend an eternity without God is refusing to accept the person of Jesus Christ. Notice the goodness of God. God is amazing. 
Very few people can know you at your worst and send you their best. I'm going to say that again. Very few people can see you at your worst and send you their best. I'd like to ask you, El Shaddai, in this season, whoever it is that you might think got issues and you would rightly assign a particular judgment to them, how about we give one another our best in spite of the fact that we even know that some of those people may deserve your worst, but we're just going to act like God. What a world that would be if all of us can come into a liberty where we recognize that it doesn't matter what has been done. What matters is like God at my worst gave me his best. I'm going to give my best to the worst of human beings. That is the message of Christmas. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. That moves me. It's not, it's not, I, I, a lot of people can celebrate you and will clap for you when, when everything is excellent, but, but only God can become a man on your behalf when you are at your worst. Behold what manner of love is this, John said, that we should be called the sons of God. Listen to me, friend, Christianity is not about proving that you are better than the world. Christianity is about loving the world in spite of their issues. Christianity is not about becoming better than another Christian. Christianity is about helping others while you know they've got issues. Christianity is not about becoming the best and the epitome of righteousness. That is who Jesus Christ is for us. Christianity is about adopting the heart of a God who in spite of what is wrong and would be right, takes the wrong and says, instead of me even putting the judgment on you, I'm going to kill myself on your behalf even though it's you that is wrong. That is the profound meaning of a baby wrapped up in swaddling clothes. That is the profound meaning. And over the last 14 years as a pastor, I have discovered one amazing truth. And that is that people never significantly change until you find them at their worst and yet believe the best about them. Oftentimes we try to beat people into shape. But listen to me, dear friend, nobody ever condemned anyone into the kingdom of God. Christmas is a time when we recognize that the order of God is that he is holy. In him there is no darkness at all. But there is something bigger that moves him than his holiness, which is, I love you too much to leave you the way you are. Instead of making the point that I'm better, I am going to come down to your level. May I ask you this Christmas, at your house, in your relationships, with your friends, with your colleagues, with church folk, with work friends, whatever the interaction may be, may I ask you this Christmas that you will be like God. And you will give your best to those that are at their worst without looking down on them. Because that is the heart of God. Now let me show you one more thing from the book of Luke. It's already been read, chapter 2. But here is the second aspect of Christmas. Number one, God loved us and gave with an excellent attitude in spite of what we had as a condition of sin. But number two, it's this. 
at the birth of Jesus Christ, the scripture says in verse 1, chapter 2 of the book of Luke, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all should all the world should be censored, I mean, should be registered in a census. So this census first took place while uh, Quirinius was governor of Syria, and so they all went, everyone to his own city. Notice, at the birth of your Savior, something happened in the natural which I believe mirrored a spiritual principle. They all had to go back to where they came from. In spite of what they had done in another city, they were going to be numbered afresh. And so Joseph took Mary and they went to Nazareth, the city in Judea, the city of David. And, 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 and in Bethlehem of the lineage of David, he, he got born and, and, and Mary and, 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 and the child who were with him, he, he, they, 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 he got born in the city while God was getting everyone from wherever they had been in life, taking them back to the beginning. And the message of Christmas is that regardless of where you've been in life, God is still sending you to the beginning. You might have been to a particular city, a city of self-condemnation or, or guilt and shame and, and sin and, and, and moral decay and, and perhaps drug abuse or whatever substance abuse, but, but, but at Christmas, before the Savior can be born, God says, I, I'm going to give you an opportunity to go back to where you came from and start again. And so today there is a Savior born in Bethlehem of Judea. So you and I can have a brand new start. And the Apostle Paul says that, that, that if any man be in Christ, when you come to Christ and you get born again, this excites me, you become a new creation. Notice as far as God is concerned, just like this census, we didn't count you in the city where you had messed up. We were going to count you from your place of origin and we originated from God. Just like this census, he says, he's going to erase your past and therefore when you get saved, when you become a Christian, you are without a past and all you have is a future. That is an amazing thing for me. So what am I saying? It's time for you to be reborn in this season. If you have had a setback in 2010, stop thinking about going away and hiding. It's time for a comeback. Amen. Because the Savior is calling you to a fresh start. Come on, let's give God a hand of praise if we believe that. And as I close... I'm going to ask one other thing. Don't let your future be subject to your past. Where you've been, you've already been. What's done is already done. But come with me to Bethlehem of Judea. And as we celebrate the birth of a Savior, let's celebrate our own comeback and our own ability to start again and, and shout glory to God in the highest and shalom, peace on earth, nothing missing and nothing broken because there's a Savior in the world. Father, I pray over these, your precious people today. As we celebrate the birth of our Lord, we thank you that you so loved us and that you didn't send him to condemn us, but you gave us your best when we were at our worst. And we're going to let the same mind be in us today to give our best to those that may not be at their best and we refuse to be those that judge and condemn. But like you, we will love a broken world. We will love our broken families. We will love our broken friends. We will love our neighbor just like you loved us without any equivocations. Now, Lord, we pray for courage to understand that there is a fresh start available. 
in spite of what has happened in 2010, we are now headed to Bethlehem. We love you so much. Now I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding. If anybody needs to accept you, Lord, I pray your spirit will minister to them. Not a condemnation of fear, but they would perceive your amazing love. That you sent a Savior just for them. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Because you do such an amazing job. We give you for a praise for it now. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen. amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to do two things, and then we will draw this meeting to a close. The first thing is this, and it is in, in, in two parts. First of all, if you've never been born again, guess what? Today is the day of salvation. This is not a fairy tale. It's not a good story. It actually affects your eternal destiny. When I was growing up in church, they would say things like, get born again and then you will live forever. That's not completely true. Whether or not you get born again, you will still live forever. The only question is, where will you spend eternity? Listen, friend, I would be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity because I believe in the reality of heaven and hell. Somebody says, why? I thought you were educated. Well, if, if, if hell did not exist, then Calvary is the greatest blunder of the ages. For God to kill his son to save us from a non-existent place. I believe in hell because the Bible teaches it, because the death of Jesus Christ demonstrates it, because Jesus spoke about it. But more than that, I believe that the scripture says if any human being ever gets to hell because that's not the will of God for them, there will be an intruder since it wasn't created for them. God's purpose and his intent is that you and I may spend all of eternity with him. But you must be born again, the scripture says. In other words, you must make a decision. If you're backslidden, you must repent and come back to God. So I'm giving you an opportunity today. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you can't remember a day when you say, Jesus, come into my heart. I recognize that I am a sinner. I have missed the mark. I've lived life my own way. But I also realize that if that's true, what that man is saying, that you stood in my place, then I am ready and willing to accept your sacrifice. And because of that, I will be free from my past. And God will give me a brand new start. While every head is bowed, please, and every eye closed, I'm asking you to put your hand up today. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm asking those of you that have never been born again, would you lift your hand up today? Looking right across the room. I see that hand right at the back. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's give God praise tonight. 